Thank you, Dr. Khalil, for that uh, splendid introduction. And uh, it's great to be here and see uh, my friends uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the community. Um, I'm kind of half expecting to see Dr. Willerson here. Um, uh, that uh, I miss him, um, as we all do. Uh, but that being said, uh, I've, I've, uh, I'm really happy to be here again uh, to talk a little bit about our work. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, two, two areas in, in the laboratory that I'm trying to bring together. Uh, so you'll, you'll see that the talk is, uh, it's a new, it's a, it has some new and has some old uh, pieces uh, and trying to integrate these two programs that I have. One on uh, this idea that uh, inflammation plays an important role in cell fate transitions and uh, cell identity and uh, regeneration. And uh, then uh, some work that we're doing in vascular aging. Um, the, um, I do think that vascular aging is uh, the major cause of cardiovascular disease, which is, of course, as we all know, major cause of morbidity and mortality uh, in the United States and around the world. The um, major risk factor for cardiovascular disease is age. Thanks for that. Um, much better. And um, of course, uh, William Osler uh, made the nice comment that life strategies are usually arterial. And, and we have uh, this nice slide from Frank Netter that shows the arterial uh, manifestations of um, cardiovascular disease. And um, the uh, cause of that, I think, uh, is initiated in the endothelium. And I really do believe that you're only as old as your endothelium. I've been studying endothelium now for over 35 years. And I do believe that this, um, this uh, tissue plays a very important role in cardiovascular health. So the endothelium is a diaphanous film of tissue that exerts tremendous control over vessel tone, vessel structure, and circulating blood elements. And when the endothelium becomes diseased, it becomes diseased with exposure to cholesterol and uh, hyperglycemia and, uh, and uh, hypertension and aging, uh, it becomes um, abnormal. The senescent endothelium looks abnormal. It's uh, more polygonal in shape. It doesn't align well with shear stress and expresses adhesion molecules and chemokines that participate in the atherosclerotic process. Uh, this is a nice uh, overview of the hallmarks of endothelial aging. And, and down below, you see many of the processes that are involved in endothelial homeostasis. Vascular homeostasis can, is uh, due to uh, endothelial release of uh, paracrine factors that cause vasodilation, that suppress vascular spumosal proliferation, that suppress interaction of the blood elements with the vessel wall. And when you lose that protection, um, then uh, the um, uh, vascular disease begins to occur. So, and I think that is one of the first steps in vascular disease generally is endothelial dysfunction, loss of that vasoprotection, loss of those paracrine factors that are um, causing vasodilation and suppressing adhesion molecule and chemokine release. Interesting work um, by Chang and Harley uh, several decades ago, uh, but really, really, I think relevant to the talk today uh, was their finding that endothelial cells at bends and branches and bifurcations are aging faster, presumably under the disturbed flow conditions that occur in those regions. And it is known that uh, that atheroma tends to form at sites of disturbed flow. Um, uh, Myron Sabolsky showed years ago that uh, at, at these sites of bends, branches, and bifurcations, the vessel is atheroprone. It's already expressing adhesion molecules and chemokines. There may not be lesions there, but the endothelial cells are putting the, those areas of the blood vessel at risk uh, for atheroma. And that's where atheroma tends to aggregate at those bends and branches and bifurcations. The Chang and Hurley showed that at those sites, the, the telomeres were shorter. They looked at the internal mammary artery, the endothelial cells of the internal mammary artery, and found that uh, the, those telomeres were longer than uh, in, uh, at the sites of uh, uh, bends and branches, they looked at the area of bifurcation. The endothelial cells there were, were much uh, uh, were shorter. Uh, this is in patients, human patients, human uh, uh, vasculature. Uh, they found that there were sites of focal senescence. So it's an interesting concept that there are uh, areas of our body that might age faster 
I think that's very familiar to us, those of us that have, uh, uh, like myself, that have uh, actinic damage, skin uh, damage due to the sun. There's at, at, at uh, those sun exposed areas, you have accelerated uh, aging. If you're a smoker, you have accelerated aging also. Uh, in, uh, in your face, you can see the fine wrinkles, the cigarette paper facies in those patients. So this idea of focal senescence is not a new one, but I, it also applies to the vasculature. This is a really, if you're interested in aging, this is a, a great paper to read, a nice review uh, of the Copenhagen conference in, 19, in 2022. And uh, at that conference, they uh, revised the Hallmarks of Aging, which was a, a great paper published, I think, in Cell by Lopez Otin uh, and, uh, in 2003. That uh, update in 2022 uh, included those um, uh, features to the right. Uh, so on the left are kind of accepted Hallmarks of Aging, uh, and on the right were some new ones that were added at the Copenhagen Conference and, and probably uh, more to come. Uh, we're gonna be focusing on inflammation and telomere attrition. And I'll, uh, uh, I'm going to be making the point that telomere attrition might be uh, one of the master regulators of aging because many of the uh, features of aging that you see here can be, they are reversible uh, with the reversal of uh, telomere attrition, uh, including inflammation. Um, we, we've, and I, I've shown this slide before to this group uh, that uh, uh, we, we've previously shown that mRNA telomerase can uh, extend the lifespan of human cells. And in this paper, we um, doubled the lifespan of a human fibroblasts without trying too hard. It was uh, just uh, three treatments of mRNA telomerase uh, could, uh, over a period of a week, could um, uh, increase uh, replicative capacity of these senescent fibroblasts. And even after they became senescent again, as you can see in that top curve, uh, added mRNA telomerase, and they were they could start to uh, replicate again, but but the effect of uh, telomerase it, uh, goes beyond um, an effect on replicative capacity. We've also shown that it reverses many of the hallmarks of aging. I'll show you some of that data uh, from our progeria model. So we uh, have cells from these kids with progeria fibroblasts from, from these children. Uh, and uh, we've been studying them. I'll show you some data in just a moment. But uh, I think most of you are familiar with this condition, hutchinson uh, guilford progeria syndrome. Uh, it causes accelerated aging in children. And you can see the, the typical phenotype. Uh, they lose the baby fat. They've got alopecia. They uh, are, uh, so their growth is stunted. Um, and um, they have many of the features of aging. But what they succumb to at the age of 13, 14, 15 years is coronary artery disease. Uh, some of them also, uh, well, some of them uh, succumb to stroke, but most of them uh, succumb to coronary artery disease. In any event, uh, they've got arterial occlusive disease uh, that leads to their demise. So uh, we were interested to understand what was the role of the endothelium in this process. And remember, we're, I'm coming at this with a bias. Uh, we, we think that the endothelium is where um, vascular disease originates, the, the first step in. Uh, vascular disease is loss of that protective, uh, vasoprotective endothelium. It's maintaining homeostasis of the vasculature. So progeria is due to a spontaneous mutation of lamin A. Um, and, and in this condition, uh, the lamin A remains farnesylated. Uh, it can't get clipped. That farnesyl group can't get clipped off the protein. Uh, it's due to a mutation in the protein, uh, that, the loss of a splice site for that uh, farnesyl. Um, a cleavage site for that farnesyl group. And uh, what happens then is the farnesyl group uh, localizes the um, lamin, the, the abnormal progerin in the nuclear envelope, and the nuclear envelope becomes markedly distorted, as you can see here. The nuclear envelope should be nice and oval, right? Here it's very distorted, and um, that uh, is associated with uh, that change in architecture is associated with uh, global changes in the transcriptional profile of these cells and changes in function. One thing of interest is that we all accumulate some progerin as we get older. And uh, this, this uh, disease is associated with telomere erosion. So we we're interested to see if, uh, if we could, first of all, uh, generate endothelial cells from these kids. And secondly, uh, how, you know, uh, to understand the, uh, if the hallmarks of aging were present in those endothelial cells. And we were interested to see if we could reverse it, uh, the abnormalities. So, we uh, made uh, iPSCs 
from the kid's fibroblasts. So iPSCs are induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, basically, we use a technique, I'll, I'll mention it in a, in a few slides later, uh, generated by Yamanaka, uh, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for it in 2012. Uh, and uh, basically, one can generate uh, a stem cell, a pluripotent stem cell from fibroblasts or other somatic cells. So we use his technology to generate the iPSCs. And uh, the iPSCs are normal from, from these children. Uh, the induced pluripotent stem cells are fully normal. Uh, now, one thing about the iPSCs is they do have telomerase activity, which is kind of interesting. So they don't show any signs, manifestations of aging. Uh, they have uh, increased telomerase activity, have normal expression of the stem cell markers, and they can be differentiated. But once you differentiate them into endothelial cells, uh, these um, iPS-derived endothelial cells are very, very abnormal. Uh, we also had fibroblasts from the parents um, and generated, in the same way, generated iPSC-derived endothelial cells. So here um, uh, in panel A, you see the uh, uh, a, a, um, a study of the telomere length. Uh, we're using a probe for the telomere in this QFISH technology, and we can measure telomere length in the uh, parental uh, endothelial cells. So these are the parents of the kids. Uh, they don't have the mutation. The mutation is spontaneous. It's not uh, familial. Uh, so it's a good control. Um, and then the, the endothelial cells from the kids have uh, shorter telomeres. Now we were able to restore telomere length uh, with the mRNA telomerase treatment. So you see that uh, in panel B, the uh, parental uh, endothelial cells have a, a telomere length that is greater than the children, uh, the, the endothelial cells derived from their children. And uh, with uh, telomerase treatment, we could restore the telomere length of those um, uh, endothelial cells, the telomeres, so those endothelial cells. The effect on proliferative capacity uh, was not unexpected. So we see uh, in black the proliferation of the uh, parental endothelial cells, in red uh, the progeria endothelial cells, in blue the progeria endothelial cells after treatment with h -turt. So that was exciting that we could, first of all, show that uh, these uh, endothelial cells were abnormal and um, that we could reverse the abnormality and proliferative capacity. But there's more. There was a striking um, uh, morphological abnormalities within the uh, HGPS endothelial cells that, that are consistent with aging. So um, in panel A, you see the parental endothelial cells. In HGPS endothelial cells, the, there's fewer of them. They don't proliferate as well. We've already seen that. But they're also uh, rounder. They're flatter. Uh, we call them, um, we say they have a fried egg appearance. So that's classic for senescent endothelial cells, this fried egg appearance. Uh, after telomerase treatment, the morphology um, normalizes. And look at what happens to the nuclei. Down below, you have uh, nuclear staining with lamin A. And you can see the normal, nice uh, normal uh, oval uh, envelope in the non-HGPS endothelial cells. It's distorted in the HGPS endothelial cells and normalized uh, with uh, telomerase. Um, that we, we still don't entirely understand the, the mechanisms of that uh, morphological change, because I'll show you there's also global changes in the transcriptional profile with the telomerase treatment. Um, and then uh, in panel C and D, basically they're about cell shape, cell area, which are, uh, are, are abnormal in these uh, endothelial cells from the kids, as, as you can see, and uh, normalized with the telomerase treatment. Um, in panel E, actually, we saw something that was interesting. Again, we don't really have the explanation, but there was a tendency for a reduction in progerin levels in those progeria cells that were treated with telomerase. Um, another thing that was really interesting is that DNA damage signals were reversed. And I, I don't have the data to show you now, but this, is, this, this was just a reversal of DNA damage signals. Gamma H2AX and 53PP1 are proteins that um, localize at sites of DNA damage. And there was much more expression, as you can see with the immunohistochemistry um, in that panel A. In the HGPS endothelial cells, there was much greater expression of uh, gamma H2AX and 53BP1 in the nucleus. And that was reversible uh, with the uh, telomerase uh, treatment. Um, but I also caution my, my uh, postdocs I, that the markers of, of DNA damage do not mean that there is DNA damage. We're just, and, and the reversal of those markers uh, does not mean that we've reversed DNA damage, most particularly with the telomerase. So we, had a, we have now data uh, showing that uh, genomic DNA damage is actually uh, 
present in these cells and reversed by uh, the telomerase treatment. Uh, so I think that uh, this, this is uh, data, it reflects uh, a real phenomenon. Um, I'm going to be talking about inflammation and its role in aging. And um, uh, people who study uh, aging cells are very familiar with this concept of senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Uh, just so I, I, I get some idea, uh, how many of you guys uh, know about this phenomenon, senescence-associated secretory phenotype? Just raise your hand. I'm just trying to get an idea. Uh, okay. So I'll explain it a little bit more. Um, senescent cells are... are very active, actually, uh, in terms of what they produce. They produce inflammatory cytokines, a lot of inflammatory cytokines. And they make the cells around them sick because of that uh, production of inflammatory cytokines. And that has led to something I'm not going to talk about today, but, but it was featured at the American Heart Association, um, senolytic therapy. How many people have heard of senolytic therapy? If you're at the American Heart Association, you might have, you might have seen some of the presentations on senolytic therapy. Um, so here's the idea, uh, and it's really been developed very nicely by James Kirkland at Mayo Clinic. Um, senescent cells are making the other cells around them sick. They're making them dysfunctional by the production of these inflammatory cytokines. Why don't we try to get rid of the senescent cells? So in uh, genetically engineered models, he was able to show that if you get rid of the senescent cells, if you ablate the senescent cells, the animal actually is rejuvenated. The animal's rejuvenated, and that extends to the heart too. Uh, one of the things you see in a rodent with, uh, that's aged is the heart becomes, um, the, 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 the ventricular wall thickness increases. The, the ventricular um, um, uh, re relaxation is reduced, compliance is reduced. And um, that can be reversed by ablating the senescent cells. So um, uh, James Crickland and others are developing senolytic therapies, uh, and, and the one that's uh, really, uh, two that are really uh, uh, getting a lot of uh, interest is our fisetin, that's one, and then a combination of um, desitinib and uh, quercetin. Uh, those are the senolytic therapies under investigation right now. James Crickland has about 20 different clinical trials going on right now to investigate getting rid of senescent cells. So he gets up and he talks about getting rid of senescent cells, and I get up and I talk about um, why not make them better? <laughs> why not make them, uh, you know, normal, normalize them? So anyway, uh, there's two different approaches, but I think uh, the approach to age-related disease is going to be multifactorial. We'll need both approaches and others uh, for age-related diseases. Anyway, this slide is showing senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And what you're looking at on the left A is a heat map of, of, of inflammatory cytokines, um, and you can see that the HGPS endothelial cells have more intense expression in red. Red is more intense expression of uh, these uh, chemokines. And um, some of these are anti-inflammatory. The ones uh, in the non-HGPS ECs like IL-10, that's an anti-inflammatory. That is uh, up in uh, non-HGPS and down in the HGPS. In any event, uh, the, you can see the heat map is very different between the uh, normal and the senescent endothelial cells, and you can see um, partial reversal of the abnormality with the telomerase treatment. Now, we can take the condition medium from those endothelial cells and expose that condition medium to the vascular smooth muscle cells, and that's what you see the results of that in panel D. And um, if you take the uh, uh, condition medium from the uh, normal parental cells, um, the production of inflammatory cytokines is not very dramatic, but you see dramatic upregulation. Again, the red color uh, from we're using HGPS uh, condition medium, and then uh, again that is reversed uh, with uh, telomerase treatment. So, so the the point is is that um, inflammatory cytokines made by these senescent cells are making other cells around them sick. Um, another thing we found that was uh, that I haven't shown um, is um, uh, mechanical aging. Uh, so uh, cells actually, uh, as they age, they have some um, mechanical alterations. And those mechanical alterations uh, uh, impair their ability to sense uh, physical forces. So one of the things the endothelium does is to sense the tractive force of fluid flow. So it, it, it senses shear stress. And in response to an increase in shear stress, the endothelium will release nitric oxide. That causes a vasodilation of the blood vessel. And because of that vasodilation, the shear stress on the vessel wall is reduced. So um, the ability of the endothelium to respond to physical forces is very important. 
for cardiovascular homeostasis. And that uh, there's uh, increasing data uh, from our from us and other groups that uh, mechanical aging does occur uh, in in cells and endothelial cells. Here's one example of that. Uh, we're showing um, the effects of uh, of shear stress um, and on uh, YAP, which is a transcriptional activator, uh, and um, actin filaments. Um, now, a normal uh, normal endothelial cell will will uh, uh, will uh, reduce actually the, the translocation of YAP to the nucleus. So that YAP stays in the cytoplasm. Uh, but you see in the HGPS endothelial cells that it's more uh, nuclear. Um, and uh, you also see with the uh, uh, HGPS endothelial cells, there's less alignment of the uh, actin filaments. Um, endothelial cells will align with shear stress, and that is impaired in, the, in progeria. Another thing that we did uh, was to uh, look using um, atomic force microscopy at the um, um, physical properties of, of, the, of the cell, the, the um, uh, flexibility of the cell uh, using atomic force microscopy and a cantilever. So basically, we're just pushing on the top of the cell, as you can see here in panel B, and we're looking at the deformation. Of, of the cell in response to that uh, cantilever. And uh, what you can see on the right is the elastic modulus. You can see that in HGPS endothelial cells, the, the cells are much stiffer. And what that means is that it takes more force uh, to deform uh, the endothelial cell, the aged endothelial cell. And that means that the aged endothelial cell is not gonna be as responsive to physical forces. So anyway, we, we've shown now that uh, we can reverse many of the hallmarks of aging uh, using telomerase in these progeria endothelial cells. We also went on to show in a mouse model of progeria that we could extend the lifespan of those animals with uh, telomerase treatment. Um, but I wanna get to that, back to this idea of that uh, senescence, the release of inflammatory cytokines changes cell identity. And uh, the heat map in uh, panel B uh, just uh, shows those genes that are dysregulated in endothelial cells. There are about 1,200 genes that were dysregulated in uh, the HGPS endothelial cells, and uh, partially restored by the telomerase treatment. So um, what we found uh, generally in the aged endothelial cells, there's less production of nitric oxide, there's more production of reactive oxygen species, there's more production of uh, adhesion molecules and chemokines, everything that you expect uh, in an endothelial cell that's diseased, uh, we see with aging. Now, here's something, an interesting new direction for our laboratory. I mean, we've been focusing on atherosclerosis, but um, we're also wondering about the role of um, senescent endothelial cells in dementia. And uh, so we studied, senesc we studied the endothelial cells in our HGPS mice and uh, we used uh, uh, stain for beta-gal, which is a senescent marker, and von Willebrand factor, which is an endothelial marker. And we saw a significant amount of co-localization of this senescence marker with the endothelial cells in the brains of these uh, HGPS mice. So these mice have the same mutation that the children do. And uh, they, ha they, they have many of the manifestations of the kids. They have accelerated aging. They die at a relatively young age, and uh, they have uh, vascular disease. Um, it's a different vascular disease than the kids, but they, they, uh, it's, it's, they lose uh, the media of the, uh, of the vessel. They have medial, medial atrophy. And they also express adhesion molecules and chemokines on the endothelium. In any event, uh, you, show, uh, you see the comparison in, uh, the, um, on the right. The beta-gal was increased in these uh, endothelial cells, cerebral vascular endothelial cells. So in the brain, there's more of these senescent cells. And uh, we also see evidence of DNA damage and more evidence of DNA damage in, in the brain endothelial cells. Now, um, one thing is very interesting and, and, and I don't, you know, it's very preliminary right now, but we have data that these HGPS mice have problems with memory. So they have more of these senescent endothelial cells. You could imagine, again, SAS phenotype, they're producing inflammatory cytokines. They're affecting the cells around them, the neurons and the astrocytes and the microglia they're, they're, they're probably uh, having an adverse effect on uh, the neuronal unit. Uh, so we're very interested to explore the role of these uh, senescent cells in dementia. Now, uh, I got further interested in this when we started looking at brain slices from patients uh, from our, our Alzheimer's center. 
Um, now you see uh, in panel A, uh, immunohistochemistry from patients without dementia and patients with dementia. Um, now, in, in both cases, uh, there's, there's an N of three in, in each of these groups. So it were early days yet. Uh, but um, the, um, I should say the dementia category was a special form of dementia. It's uh, dementia that occurs in older folks with ALS. So that's rare. Uh, but uh, uh, it was the first group that we had to look at. And uh, we, we found actually a fair amount of... Um, staining of beta-gal in the endothelial cells, as you can see here. So beta-gal is, a, again, the senescent stain, von Willebrand factor is the endothelial stain. And you can see that uh, in the patients with dementia, there was more of these um, uh, beta-gal positive endothelial cells. Uh, it was quite amazing. It was almost half of the endothelial cells, actually more than half the endothelial cells in the brains of these patients with dementia were senescent. But even the older non-dimension patients had a fair amount of senescent endothelial cells. And I'm beginning to think now that my uh, you know, slips in memory might be due to my endothelial cells becoming aged in my brain. And uh, so I, I really wanna understand what is the mechanism of senescence in these endothelial cells. Uh, so more to come on that. Oh, and gamma H2AX again, the, the DNA damage marker was increased. So back to this idea of aging as a change in cellular identity. I've shown you um, functional data, transcriptional data, morphological data uh, showing that the endothelial cells actually, their cellular identity is changing. Their function is changing. And um, I think that uh, this process is reversible. Um, so here's the, the SASP again, uh, the slide showing the, uh, the various manifestations of SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype and uh, some of the roles that it has in cancer progression and chronic inflammation, uh, recruitment of immune cells. But here's one you may not know about. Uh, it also seems to be important in tissue repair. So senescence is not entirely, um, senescence, uh, senescence is not entirely um, uh, a negative thing because in some situations, uh, senescent cells are important. And uh, it's now uh, evident in wound healing that uh, senescent cells are, are uh, induced, uh, cellular senescence is induced in the setting of the wound. And uh, if you block that development of senescent cells, uh, you actually, uh, wound healing is impaired because these senescent cells are, again, expressing inflammatory cytokines that are drawing immune cells to the site of the wound. But in this case, the immune cells are important in, in the wound healing process. So uh, there's increasing evidence that senescent cells play a role in optimal wound healing. And that allows me to, to segue into this uh, new part of the talk, a, a different part of the talk on the role of inflammatory signaling in, um, in uh, regeneration. So we have a, a lot of data now uh, showing that inflammatory signaling induces epigenetic plasticity. Um, and that epigenetic plasticity it allows for uh, cell fate transitions. Um, we've shown that this inflammatory signaling leads to global changes in epigenetic modifiers that are regulating DNA accessibility. Metabolic coupling is involved. Um, uh, Heinrich has helped us with that, Dr. Techmeyer. DNA accessibility is the result of these changes uh, permitting cell fate transition. And this is a very important process, I believe, in cellular response to a challenge. If that challenge is uh, a pathogen, uh, if that challenge is damage, the release of inflammatory cytokines, well-described pathway, it's known, uh, but what we've discovered was that the same inflammatory signaling pathway also plays a role in the ability of the cell to respond by a change in its fate, in the change of its phenotype. Uh, so you can imagine um, uh, an endothelial cell that's at the site of uh, vascular damage, maybe uh, uh, a uh, laceration. Uh, that endothelial cell is gonna have to change its phenotype. Normally endothelial cells are sitting in the, in, the, in the vessel, quiescent, making nitric oxide. But now you have some damage um, and, and the endothelial cell has to start to migrate, proliferate, you know, form tubes and form new vasculature uh, to help repair that wound. So, this process of uh, uh, inflammatory signaling inducing DNA accessibility and cell fate transition is an important process in response to injury. 
It's an important process in response to pathogens, uh, but it also uh, can get out of control and contribute to uh, pathology. Think of the vascular muscle cells that are in, in, in the, the media of the vascular wall. We now know that some of those vascular muscle cells under the onslaught of hypercholesterolemia uh, can, um, and oxidized LDL cholesterol can change their fate. They, they, be, they begin to look more like macrophage. They absorb oxidized lipid and, and they become foam cells, but they're vascular smooth muscle cells initially that have changed their, their phenotype in response to a need, a need to clear oxidized lipoprotein from the vessel wall. So I mentioned this guy earlier. I think, who, who knows Shinya Yamanaka? Again, I, I just trying to understand what my, your knowledge base here. And um, so uh, Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in 2012 because he did something that galvanized the regenerative medicine field. It was, it was quite amazing. He showed us that with the overexpression of four transcriptional factors, OC4, SOX2, KL4, c -MIC, he could change a somatic cell fibroblast into a in pluripotent stem cell. This solved a lot of problems for the regenerative medicine field because these induced pluripotent stem cells could become any other cell in the body and uh, it uh, they could have regenerative benefit. It allowed us to understand disease processes in individuals whom we didn't understand the pathology. One example of that, I had a, a, one of my colleagues at Stanford had a child with a, a form of autism that was not um, understood. So uh, he um, actually took some skin fibroblasts from his kid, cultured them, uh, generated these uh, uh, iPSCs using Yamanaka's approach. And now he could differentiate those iPSCs into the cells he wanted. Well, the cells he wanted were, were brain cells, neurons. He wanted to know what was wrong with his, his child's neurons. So uh, he um, made neurons. He had his child's brain cells in a dish. And now he could experiment with them. And he found that there was an ion channel abnormality did a, uh, a small molecule screen uh, and found a generic drug that corrected the abnormality, and that is in clinical trials uh, with those children. So it, it, uh, it, one thing it did for us uh, was uh, it allowed us to turn the crank much faster in terms of understanding disease processes and then developing a therapeutic approach to those disease processes. So Shinya Yamanaka uh, published his first paper in 2006. He wins the Nobel Prize in 2012. Land speed record for winning the Nobel Prize, but deservedly so. But we published a paper the same month he got the Nobel Prize, showing that he was half right. And uh, and uh, on the right you see, you know, these transcriptional activators, OC4, SOX2, KL4, CMYK, are absolutely critical uh, for the transcriptional direction to drive fibroblasts to to whatever to induce pluripotent stem cells. But what he did not know is that the retroviral vector that he was using to uh, overexpress those factors in cells, that retroviral vector was activating inflammation in the cell. That inflammatory signaling was inducing an epigenetic modifications that opened up the chromatin to allow those Yamanaka factors to work. Um, and so anyway, there was just a little bit of data from that. Um, IPSCs uh, in B are cell colonies uh, of about 300, 400 cells. Uh, the cells are large, round, large nucleus in the center of those cells. They look very different from the fibroblasts from which they were derived. Um, but if we uh, knocked out uh, these factors that are involved in inflammatory signaling that are involved in sensing the retroviral vector, uh, TLR3 specifically, and its adapter, TRIF, uh, we couldn't get iPSCs. So we used the Yamanaka approach to generate iPSCs, but if we block the inflammatory signaling, uh, we uh, uh, could not get iPSCs. So inflammatory signaling is important in the generation of these iPSCs. And uh, here's another um, uh, piece of data from that paper where we used uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts that had the Yamanaka factors as a cassette that was doxycycline inducible. So we can simply add dox to the medium and the fibroblast will start to transform into induced pluripotent stem cells that can become any cell. Um, and uh, in, in this case, uh, we added uh, poly IC, which is uh, same, uh, st stimulates the same uh, pathway that the retroviral vector does. Uh, retroviral vector stimulates TLR3, and uh, we could get more iPSCs. And then uh, if we blocked inflammatory signaling with uh, an inhibitor of NF-kappa B, we got uh, less iPSCs. So inflammatory signal is very critical. Anyway, I can't go through all the data. It's, it's sev several years of work. But what we found is that inflammatory signaling uh, basically opens up the DNA. 
Um, so a fibroblast at, 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 at the site of, of, of a pluripotent gene like OC4, uh, OC4 is, is suppressed. The chromatin is closed. Uh, fa uh, transcriptional factors can't get access to it. But with inflammatory signaling, the chromatin opens up. And uh, now um, factors, epigenetic factors, transcriptional factors can have, have access to that DNA and can um, act on it. Now, um, here's the thing. Um, there is a Goldilocks zone for this phenomenon. Um, a certain amount of inflammation in that Goldilocks zone uh, enhances cellular transitions. In this case, uh, uh, Paula Shanda was looking at generation of iPSCs, but it, this is true of any cell fate transition. I'm focusing on iPSCs because we have most of the data with those, but any cell fate transition requires inflammatory signaling uh, that we've looked at. Um, but there is a Goldilocks zone, uh, the right amount of inflammation. And as clinicians, you already know this, right? Um, so some amount of inflammatory signaling is necessary for wound healing. Take the patients on steroids. We use steroids and we, we can suppress this cell fate transition. In our patients, cell fate transitions are suppressed in my opinion, and that's why their wounds don't heal because the keratinocytes can't migrate across the wound. It, it requires a change in phenotype to do that. Um, on the other flip side of it, take the patient with diabetes and a diabetic foot ulcer. You'll, if you'll, you'll recall, those patients have a red ring around that diabetic foot ulcer, and the surgeons actually have to remove that, that inflammatory region of the wound for the wound to heal. Um, so I, I do think that this uh, is also involved in uh, a phenomenon that we're, we've been studying, uh, which is uh, angiogenic transdifferentiation. We've been studying fibroblast transdifferentiation to endothelial cells. And this process goes back and forth. Um, uh, I, I believe that a lot of the fibrosis we see in our patients, cardiac fibrosis, nephrosclerosis, uh, those processes involve an endothelial to mesenchyme transition where the endothelial cells undergo a cell fate transition that pushes them to fibroblasts. But the reverse is also true. We have very good data now to show that fibroblasts in tissue can revert to endothelial cells in a situation uh, where, where that is required. For example, ischemia. And the, and the process, again, requires inflammation. And then transcriptional factors or factors in the environment like VEGF that push, push in a certain transcriptional direction. So you need the inflammation for the, for the DNA accessibility, and then you need something to push the cell uh, toward the phenotype that you're interested in. Um, one, of the, one of the ways we did this was to um, uh, activate fibroblasts with poly-IC, our, our uh, schematic up on panel A. We activated uh, fibroblasts with poly-IC inflammatory signaling, put them in a state of DNA accessibility, and then we just added factors to the medium that we learned could uh, uh, push those fibroblasts toward endothelial phenotype. Uh, VEGF, uh, basic fibroblast growth factor, uh, eight bromocyclic AMP, and we also used a TGF beta receptor inhibitor. And uh, the uh, induced endothelial cells that we got from those fibroblasts looked every bit like uh, endothelial cells. I think just focus on panel G for this slide. Uh, these uh, former fibroblasts now could form tubes, vascular networks in matrigel. They made nitric oxide, they expressed endothelial uh, markers like CD31, and uh, it virtually looked uh, very much like uh, endothelial cells. This process does involve inflammatory signaling and uh, Xu Meng, whose picture I showed you just a moment ago, uh, she showed that NF-kappa B is very important in this phenomenon, uh, and it induces INOS, inducible anosynthase, translocates to the nucleus to uh, nitrosylate epigenetic modifiers, inactivating them, causing them to fall off the chrominant. So the polycomb complex, the NERD complex are nitrosylated, fall off the chrominant, increasing DNA accessibility. And I am getting short on time. So... This is work that we got some help uh, from you, Heinrich Techmeyer, um, the, the role of um, a glycolytic switch in this process. And um, I, I won't have time to go over it, but uh, uh, Lee Lai has shown very nicely that uh, glycolytic switch occurs with this, this inflammatory signaling 
absolutely critical for the uh, epigenetic plasticity that occurs. So uh, the glycolytic switch uh, increases citrate supply to the nucleus where it's converted into acetyl-CoA for histone acetylation. Very important process, histone acetylation to open up the chrominin. So that was a metabolic switch that um, we got some help from Henrik with. And uh, more recently, uh, another uh, epigenetic modulator that is a metabolite, uh, uh, glicnac, uh, glicnacylation also, uh, like acetylation, uh, opens up the chrominin. And uh, we've, uh, Lily has shown that that uh, glycolytic switch that uh, uh, in induces the production of glicnacylation also um, increases DNA accessibility. I'm going to skip through this because I want to have a little time for questions. Um, but um, maybe, maybe I, I just briefly mentioned in um, lineage tracing mice, we've shown that this a process of transdifferentiation occurs in tissue that's ischemic. Uh, and we've shown that uh, uh, endothelial cells are derived from fibroblasts in the tissue uh, using lineage tracing. Uh, we've done single cell analysis of, of these cells and picked out those uh, fibroblasts. Two, there's two groups of fibroblasts that support the uh, transdifferentiation. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, fact sort them from the fibroblasts of the hind limb of these animals and show, in fact, that one of them produces angiogenic cytokines. That's uh, the cluster eight fibroblast. Cluster five, just look at that one. Um, cluster five cells, if you grow them in 2D culture, they look like fibroblasts. But if you grow them in matrigel, they start forming tubes. So the tube formation on matrigel is not a characteristic of fibroblasts, but it is a characteristic of these fibroblasts that have the capability of becoming endothelial cells. Anyway, we've uh, got increasing data to support this idea that there's an angiogenic transdifferentiation that plays a role in the response to ischemia. Inflammatory signaling triggers uh, DNA accessibility together with this glycolytic shift and allows fibroblasts to support uh, the uh, expansion of the microvasculature that occurs in the setting of ischemia. So we're, we're continuing to study the role of, of uh, inflammatory signaling in, um, it's, it's, uh, in regeneration and inflammatory signaling also in aging, uh, because we think that uh, excessive uh, production of inflammatory cytokines can actually, uh, we have evidence that it actually reduces the ability of cell fate uh, to change. Cell fate transition is uh, impaired, and that may be why um, older folks become less resilient, uh, because that uh, they, they're, in a, they're outside of the Goldilocks zone and they can't uh, heal their wounds. They can't heal their fractures. They, they, uh, they have uh, more, more trouble with uh, challenges like that because they're on the other side of the Goldilocks zone. In any event, I'll stop here. Uh, that was a lot of data I, I went over with you. Um, we interested in your thoughts. Uh, this is uh, our Department of Cardiovascular Sciences across the uh, street there, and uh, look forward to uh, working with you, collaborating with you, sharing our ideas. Thank you so much.